Greetings, everyone. Hope all of you are having an absolutely fantastic day. Let's get right back into Pathfinder and go through another build. This time, I want to try to revisit one of our builds from the past. I made a orc that was a blood rager who dipped into Dragon Disciple. A lot of you liked the concept, but you felt like the execution of that build could have been better. I want to take another crack at it, see if we can get it right this time. But I don't want to use Steel Blood, which is what I used for the first video because now Owlcat has added Reformed Fiend, specifically for the Tieflings, and I wanna go through it. See if it meshes well with the Azada Mythic Path. Let's go ahead and dive in. As always, if you enjoy this video, please leave me a like below and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. So we'll go on to Blood Rager and choose Reformed Fiend, Tiefling, Heritage is Pitborn, background is River Kingdom's Daredevil, Unfortunately, the stat distribution doesn't work quite right if we take strength up to 20, so we take it up to 19, dump four points into constitution, two points into intelligence to make up for the penalty we take due to our heritage, and then the rest goes into charisma. You wanna take persuasion. You definitely wanna take knowledge arcana. Where you put this last point is up to you. I would recommend athletics, only because there's no party members that really specialize in athletics. Sila can, but she's wearing heavy armor all the time. So it's kind of cumbersome if you have to use her. For your first feat, let's go to Weapon Focus and then go to Long Spear. Bloodline is Abyssal. Deity will be Desna. Alignment is Neutral Good. You can play around with the face if you like. Get some evil looking horns. Hairstyle doesn't matter all that much. Aggressive Voice. For a third level feat, pick Power Attack. At level four, increase strength and continue increasing it throughout your level ups. For level one spells, get Magic Missile and Magic Weapon. For your level 5 spell, go ahead and pick up Dazzling Display. And then for your next level up spell, pick up Shield. At level 6, you should be able to go into Dragon Disciple. As you can see here, it requires a 5 in Knowledge Arcana. Now that you are able to get into Dragon Disciple, you don't need to increase Knowledge Arcana anymore. You definitely want Persuasion. Where you put that second point is up to you. For Blood of the Dragons, we'll choose Silver. For Dragon Disciple level 3, we'll pick up Cornigan Smash. Blood Rager is your spell casting book. For our Bloodline feat, we'll get Great Fortitude. For Dragon Disciple Level 3, Spell Level 2, get Mirror Image and Protection from Arrows. For your Dragon Disciple Level 4 feat, get Shatter Defenses. And for your next Level 2 spell, get False Life. We're done with Dragon Disciple now, so you can focus on Reform Fiend. For your bonus feat, pick Cleave. For your Level 11 feat, take Intimidating Prowess. And for Level 3 spells, take Greater Magic Weapon and Heroism. For your level 13 feet, take Dreadful Carnage. And for your bonus feet, take Toughness. And for spell level four, take False Life Greater and Dragon's Breath. And then for your level 17 feet, take Cleaving Finish. Okay, so now that we've leveled up through 17, let's look at the Mythic Path. You're gonna choose Instrument of Freedom. And then for your first Mythic ability, go ahead and choose Limitless Rage. For your Mythic Feet, go ahead and pick up Power Attack Mythic. At level three, you can choose your specific path, so go ahead and pick Azada. And then for your next mythic ability, go ahead and pick up Enduring Spells. For your level four mythic feat, go back into mythic ability. Select Mythic Charge. And then for your first superpower, select Incredible Might. For your next mythic ability, select Greater Enduring Spells. And for Azada spell level three, get Good Hope and Instant Enemy. For your final mythic feat, Go on to Improve Critical, Long Spear. And then for the final superpower I can show you, get Supersonic Speed. Okay, so before I get into how this class works in combat, let me point out a couple of things about it. We took four dips into Dragon Disciple because that gives us a plus two to natural armor along with a plus four to strength. Blood Rage gives you a plus two bonus on melee attack rolls, melee damage rolls, thrown weapon damage rolls, and will saving throws. By the time you get to level 16, this is increased to a plus five on a melee attack rolls and melee damage rolls. You do take a negative four penalty to your armor class when you get closer to the end game, but the bonuses are still well worth it, which is why we go ahead and take limitless rays to ensure we can use rage as many times as we want. Keep in mind that every time a rage ends, you will be fatigued for one minute. And when you're fatigued, you cannot charge. Basically, this is going to work out to you will begin every other fight with a charge unless you specifically wait until your fatigue status expires. 
And because we are a reform fiend, we get a steady increase to damage reduction against evil enemies and a steady increase to attack and damage rolls against evil creatures. You also get access to a dragon companion who also speaks, so there are definitely times during the game where he will speak up and make his feelings known. And there are definitely times where it is absolutely hilarious. Song of Broken Chains allows you and all your allies to be immune to compulsion spells and spell-like abilities. If you have it available, I would definitely recommend starting every fight with it. Enduring Spells and Greater Enduring Spells ensures that any buff we have that would last for 10 minutes or longer will instead last for 24 hours. So there are several buffs in this build that will be useful for your character to have on at all times. Shield gives you a plus four shield bonus to AC. Mirror Image creates illusionary doubles of you that make it difficult for enemies to precisely locate and attack you. Protection from arrows gives you damage reduction against ranged weapons. Greater Magic Weapon gives you a bonus on attack and damage rolls of plus one per four caster levels. False Life Greater gives you 2d10 plus one points per caster level. And then Old Data Miraculous Magic is actually from the Azada Spellbook. The spell grants party members a plus four morale bonus on checks to overcome spell resistance and increase the saving throw DC of their spells that require a will saving throw by two. So of course, this is not going to help you all that much, but more than likely you'll have one or two, if not more spellcasters in your party, and this will help them a great deal. And then at level three, you definitely want to have good hope on for 24 hours. It gives a plus two morale bonus, which is similar to heroism, but note that good hope gives that bonus to more things than heroism does. And more than likely your party members will not have access to good hope. And then you'll probably also want to keep on believing in yourself. This spell grants the target a plus one morale bonus to a chosen ability for each four caster levels. And then at level four, unfortunately, I don't think there are any spells that are all that great for this build. The Azada spell book does give you deadly beauty, which I guess you can keep on. It will do 1d6 per caster level points of piercing damage to any creature that attacks you in melee. Okay, we've leveled up to 17. I've went through a couple of the choices that I made for the build and why I made them. And I've also went over the buffs that I feel like should be on your person at all times. But how does this build actually work in combat? So first and foremost, you should have on all the buffs that I already mentioned before, along with any songs that are available to you. When combat kicks off, obviously you should start with rage, which is going to significantly increase both your attack and your defense and supersonic will automatically kick in. It puts you under the haste spell as long as you are engaged in combat. All melee and ranged weapon attacks also have a 20% miss chance, while spells aimed at you have a 10% miss chance. And then finally, damage from area attacks against you is halved. So you're gonna be fast and significantly more resilient. You kick things off by identifying who is going to be easiest to kill. Whoever that enemy is, you position yourself to be able to charge at them. When you charge, because you have Mythic Charge, you're going to do an additional 1d6 damage per Mythic rank, but then you're also going to trigger Incredible Might. Incredible Might adds a morale bonus equal to your Mythic rank on attack and damage rolls, and then anytime you do a charge attack or confirm a critical hit, you are going to force your enemy to try to pass a Fortitude saving throw against your Strength modifier. If they fail, you will either stun them, knock them prone, push them away and stun them, cripple them, exhaust them, or just flat out kill them. Now, the hope is that you're either going to hit them for significant damage or you're going to flat out kill them. If you are able to hit them, you'll trigger Cornigan Smash, which causes you to make an immediate persuasion check as a free action to attempt to demoralize your opponent. Because we have Intimidating Prowess, this attempt to intimidate is going to take both our Charisma modifier and our Strength modifier. As you can see here, my Strength modifier is plus eight, even with no Strength building items or buffs on this character right now. So your Strength modifier should be sky high and should absolutely be able to overcome the defenses of any enemy you attempt to demoralize as long as they actually can be demoralized which the undead usually are immune to. For every other type of enemy that is not immune to being demoralized, they will be shaken, 
which means they take a negative two penalty on attack rolls, saving throws, skill checks, and ability checks. This means that an enemy who you are able to demoralize will be much more susceptible to any attempts to damage them, and they will have a significantly harder time being able to hit you or your party members. And then because we have Great Cleave, anytime you successfully hit an enemy, you will then attempt to hit an enemy that is right next to them. So you can hit an enemy, demoralize that person, then hit the enemy right next to them, demoralize them, so on and so on until you finally miss. Keep in mind again that the effects of Incredible Might also trigger on a critical hit, which is why we take Improved Critical Mythic and Improved Critical. So while you're cleaving and hitting enemies, it's also completely possible for you to crit and trigger Incredible Might. And then if you're able to actually kill an enemy, you're gonna trigger Dreadful Carnage, which is gonna make that same demoralize attempt but it's going to do it to all enemies within a 30 foot range as a free action. So it's completely possible that all on her own, as long as you're not facing undead, this character can handle crowd control for an entire room and make enemies extremely susceptible to whatever it is you would like to do. Also note that I specifically chose long spear as my main weapon because I want to make use of cleave. So long spear is a reach weapon and hopefully I'll be able to hit more enemies with my cleave ability by having a reach weapon on my person. So now that you know how to use this build in combat, I do have a couple of party member recommendations for you. One, I don't consider this build to be a true tank. You will definitely have some resistances and be able to take some damage but I don't consider the type of character where you want to run into the middle of the room and just draw all the enemies to you, even though with Cleave that would somewhat be to your advantage. I think this character benefits from having at least one other tank with it. So I would recommend Sila as one person you bring into the party. Since you are a good-natured Azada, having Sila in the party is the best mix for you, as opposed to Camellia, who can also serve as a tank, but probably doesn't fit in as well with how you would role play this character. And then the other party member I would recommend is Nanio, specifically because one of her most powerful crowd control spells specifically targets wisdom. And her initiative is going to be higher than yours because she does start out with a couple of points of dexterity. So more than likely, she's going to be able to pull off phantasmal putrefaction before you even charge in creating a situation where the enemies are going to be even more vulnerable to what you're trying to do to them. And then finally, I do think there are two drawbacks to the build. And you all can let me know down in the comments if you see any additional ones that you feel like I should take note of. First, the build is not nearly as effective if you're fighting undead, obviously, because you can't demoralize them. It's not completely ineffective. You're still hasted, you have incredible might, and hopefully you'll be able to do some crit damage against those zombies and cause different effects. It's just not as effective as it is when you can crowd control a room full of people. The other major difference that I can see is I believe this build works best when you can charge into the back line and quickly mow down the character that you feel like is most susceptible to melee damage. But there are a lot of fights in this game where the melee enemies will keep you at a choke point, preventing you from being able to get to the archers and the spellcasters. And I think in those situations, this build becomes significantly less useful. Now, there are a couple of ways around that. You could bring a party member with you who has access to Dimension Door, which off the top of my head, both Ember and Wolgif get access to that particular power, which lets you transport your entire party to a different point on the map. The problem with that is, again, you're taking your entire party. So now they're all in the middle of the room. Yes, this character has better access to the back line, but it could also make your back line more vulnerable. The other option is there is a Mythic Path ability that gives you a move action to teleport towards any spellcaster that targets you with the spell. The problem with that, of course, is that you're depending upon the enemy spellcasters actually targeting you, which they could easily decide to go for Sela or do some sort of area effect or whatever. And if it's just archers in the back line, then of course that option is useless. 
So that's why I didn't take it and didn't see it as a real legitimate way of trying to get around that. Basically, I would say during those choke point fights, you're going to be depending more upon your party members to try to wipe them out and then clear up space for you to get into the back line and start laying down the pain. All right, and that's the build. So let me know down in the comments. Does this make sense to you from a role playing standpoint, from a build mechanism standpoint, from a combat standpoint? Do you like this character? Do you feel like it's something that you would use? Do you feel like there's something I could have done better to make this character more effective? Really looking forward to hearing all of your feedback. As always, if you like this video, please leave me a like, subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, and share this content if you know someone else who might be interested in more Pathfinder videos. We are definitely going to continue dropping content up to the release of the game. I will see you all in the next video. Take care.